We have fun here. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the Chef Twitch stream. I'm Nick Rykar, Senior Technical Product Marketing Manager here at Chef. Say that five times fast, I dare you. Uh, and I'm joined today by Natalie Fisher, who's a... Uh, what's the official title? Product manager product for manager. Chef Automate? Well, I mean, it's not really technically for Chef Automate, it's product manager, but the right product on. I work on is Chef Automate. Yeah. And Chef Automate's going to be the star of the show today. Uh, so I thought I'd give everyone a rundown of some of the cool new shinies that we've got in Chef Automate. And Natalie, I wanted to have you here to you know, talk up sort of uh, what we've got in store and what's coming down the pike. Um, the two stars of the show today are going to be some of the new uh, role-based access control and uh, identity management we've got, uh, as well as the applications dashboard for looking at the status of uh, Chef Habitat apps. Uh, but starting with uh, IAM, uh, what's new in IAM and Chef Automated? Okay, so um, if you're not familiar with what IAM is... Oh, yeah, good start. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is an identity and access management. So in most large enterprises, it's imperative to have something like that, especially one that provides a combination of resource and role-based access management. So um, our IAM solution is, um, we re which we released in early February, has the capability which includes enterprise grade role-based access control framework to enable our customers to easily manage um, large scale implementations cross teams, yeah. as well as project scoped access control capabilities that allow the administrators to delegate system management responsibilities more easily. Um, in terms of what's next for IAM, since like I said, we just released it in early February, we're going to spend some time gathering customer feedback to continue to make improvements on the user experience. Mm. So, yeah. um, to you, if you have more questions. Well, I think that's a good. Uh... Uh, kicker to start us off. Uh, so why don't I share my screen and we'll see a little bit of this in action. Uh, so very soon, I think in the next release of Chef Automate, uh, the V2 will be enabled by default when you install. That is correct. Uh, excellent. Today, um, when you install a fresh uh, install of Chef Automate, it will have uh, the existing access control. You'll be able to tell really quick if you come into the settings tab here, you won't see a tab called projects. That's sort of my indicator. If you see projects, you're on new IAM, but here I am not. So I'm actually gonna go through the process of what it looks uh, like to take an existing Chef Automate server and start playing with all of the new shinies. Uh, so I spun up a Chef Automate server earlier today. I'm gonna go ahead and SSH into it. And I did promise I was going to make this legible if I came in here, so I want to make that a little bit bigger. Uh, but nothing too fancy here. I'm just going to hop onto the box, and then I am going to run Chef Automate IAM, and I'll just do it with no commands right here so we can see what our options are. Uh, so I'm going to run Upgrade to V2. We can always reset to V1 if we don't like it. Uh, and there is an option when we upgrade uh, to not port over any existing policies if you are using any existing access management. If not, it's just going to go ahead and port over the automatic ones that get created by Chef Automate. And we'll see a little bit of that. Uh, so I'll go ahead and run this IAM and we'll run that upgrade to uh, V2 command. <clears throat> and we're done. So that simple. Uh, when I refresh my Chef Automate server now, we see a couple of extra things in access management. Uh, the first thing I want to take a look at is policies. Uh, so if you have an existing Chef Automate server and you go through this process, the first thing you'll notice is that there are a bunch of legacy policies here. Uh, since I only have a single admin user and I'm not using these policies for anything, I can go ahead and just delete them. Uh, this is just to make sure that if you install this thing, you don't uh, have access for any existing users uh, get messed up while you're testing it. Uh, so. Uh, my guidance, if you're like me and you're just starting fresh and you want to test it out, these are very safe to delete, uh, especially since all I've got is my admin user and that will still have full access. The reason it's important to delete them is if I start creating new policies and these old policies give me more access than uh, I would normally have by default, I might see some false, false positives. So I like to get rid of all my legacy policies and now I've just got the fresh roles that come with V2. Now. One of the niceties in uh, IAM v2 is that there are a few chef-managed predefined roles. Uh, you see those here as my administrator for a project. It's called owner. Uh, and then there are editors and viewers that have uh, write and read access to our stuff respectively. 
and ingest, which is primarily used just for, like the name implies, ingesting data into Chef Automate. So it doesn't give any special rights to the dashboard itself, but it will allow me to set ship data over and authenticate that way. Uh, now, the other thing that is new is the concept of projects. So what a project allows me to do is to sort distinct subsets of what I'm managing in Chef Automate. And in my environment here, I've pre-populated a few things in here. Uh, and an easy way to do this sorting right off the bat is to do some environment sorting. So right now I have a few machines in production, a few machines in development. So I'm going to create some projects so that we can sort those machines into their own projects. And then we can also apply access rules uh, to those projects accordingly. So let's go ahead and get that started. I'm going to projects. I'm going to create a project. We'll call it prod. And you'll notice that by default, it creates an odor, owner, editor, and viewer policy for this project. So while you can create custom fine-grained controls, if you want to uh, toggle specific permissions to uh, different fine-grained elements, this will at least have capture that larger case of, you know, the 80-90% of stuff you need is just, is it read-only, is it write-only, and call it a day. Or, well, read and write. <laughs> but at any rate, once I create a project, I need to give it some rules. So just calling a project prod by itself doesn't do anything. I'm going to go ahead and say prod servers. How do I identify them? I pick my resource type. In this case, it's a node. And you can add as many conditions as you want. Here I'm going to say any node where the environment, oh, not a member of, equals production. This is case sensitive. So if you put any capital P's in there, that's where it'll matter. But I didn't. Uh, and that's my rule. We're going to do the same thing for development, and you'll notice now as I'm working, there's this little bar on the bottom. So when we create these ingest policies, we do have to hit this update button that will take them live. If you have a large scale deployment, it may take a bit for that uh, apply to happen since this is a pretty fresh environment with not a lot going on. It should be more or less instantaneous. I'll do the same thing with dev though, so we may as well enable all my rules at once. And again, we'll say dev servers. I'll do it exactly the same as before node resource type, attribute is environment, and we make sure it equals development. All right, I now have two projects and two rules. I can now hit that update projects button. Again, it gives me some CYA, says it can take up to 12 hours for this to complete. Unless you're running thousands and thousands of things, probably will happen much quicker. Uh, and indeed, I suspect that, uh, oh, well, progress bar is new since the last time. That's awesome. Uh, what we end up having here is now I have a projects toggle at the top here, where even as an administrator, I still have the ability to filter my assets based on those projects. So let's see. Has it actually been applied? It looks like it has. So if I go to dev, I can see now it shows me six total nodes, one of which is failing, in compliance anyway. And if I go to prod, 16 nodes all passing. So right off the bat, I get some nice high-level data here. When I'm looking at my servers in aggregate, well, this failing uh, node might be concerning to me, but I can tell by my project filters that those failures are in dev, probably not as critical. I can also take a look for any unassigned servers. So here I can confirm that with those two roles, I have effectively captured everything I'm managing, uh, and the list goes blank once I go to unassigned. So that can be really nice as a way to see whether or not you created the projects you wanted to. Uh, now that we're able to filter between projects, it comes to uh, how do I uh, limit access to these assets? And for that, we'll go back into settings here, and I'm going to create a team. Now, I can apply roles to users directly, but uh, oftentimes it's useful to create a team so that as I'm onboarding and offboarding users, I don't need to manage their individual uh, permissions. I can just add or remove them from teams, and the teams have all of the access policies. That said, if I needed to give a particular user uh, specific privileges, I can go ahead and do that as well. But I'm going to create a team called Dev Viewers. These are folks that will only have access to the Dev Project uh, and who will be assigned the Dev Viewers role. So I can see in the details here, it's assigned to the Dev Project. I haven't created any users for it yet, but before I do, I want to go into my policies and you can see now I have editors, owners, and viewers for the two projects I created that was automatically generated for me. And I can look for that dev project viewers uh, that I called out earlier. 
You can see what our policy actually looks like. So it's a JSON formatted hash. And in our, in our docs, you can see all of the different things you could toggle if you wanted to get more fine grain than this. But for our purposes today, I just want to add some members. As you can see, all of my users and teams can be used as members, and I'm going to add dev viewers to the dev viewers policy. Now that I've done that, I can finally go ahead and add a user to that team. So I'm just going to create a new user. We'll call him dev viewer. When I'm creating these super secure passwords live, I should probably pick ones I can type better, huh? Ah, oh, fun time. So now, I have my dev viewer user. Does it work the way I described? Only one way to find out. Let's go ahead and log out, log back in, and see if my permissions are limited like I think they will be. All right, now I'm in Chef Automate, and I did something wrong. In fact, I did this thing wrong the last time I demoed this. I like doing things wrong in this way, uh, because you can actually see now. What did I forget? I created the user, I added the user to, uh, I added the team to the policy, but I didn't add the user to the team. So now you see, my user can see nothing. So I've protected myself from this foot gun. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's the thing I get, when I, when I demo chef stuff, I kind of love it when things go awry, because what does chef do? Chef tells me all of the things I just did. So I can always check my work. Uh, We'll go ahead and log back in as admin. I mean, on the bright side, you know, it works at least. <laughs> exactly. When I'm being glib, I'm like, well, you know, automation may not always work, but it'll always show its work. Uh, so I can at the very least see that, what did I forget? Dev viewers doesn't have any users in it. Huh, that probably helps. So yeah, let's add that dev user to this team. There we go. Next verse, same as the first. Log out, log in. Hey, look at that. Now I can actually go into my views. I still see only those six nodes that are in my dev environment. Uh, and indeed, the one that's failing is even failing a yum update. So something, something's wrong on this server. But another thing I love looking at here is error output. So in this case, uh, one of my machines, Chef Infra, ran unsuccessfully. It'll tell me how far it got, and it got almost nowhere. I can see what it tried to do. It tried to execute a yum update. And... Python is hosed on this machine, is the spoiler. So this is something that's just, you know, uh, regular old output I see sometimes when I'm spinning up resources on the cloud, and it's nice to be able to get that. Uh, in this case, I'd probably just nuke and redeploy that machine since all of the rest of them are doing fine. But uh, indeed, now you can see when I go up into the project area we were looking at before, it's no longer clickable. This is the only project that my user has access to, and I don't even have the option to create scans or anything since I am a read-only user. Um, so that's sort of a quick look at what the IAM functionality has in store for us. Uh, and it's something that uh, you can get pretty fancy with. Uh, to learn some more, uh, the docs on automate.chef.io uh, go through in the authorization section an overview. So all the stuff we just covered, uh, how the sort of permissions authentication works. So we look at who we are, uh, and then we look for any policies that are assigned either to our user or team, and then probably usually for ingest users and API token. Uh, then we can go ahead and see, have we given any uh, access to the resource that's being asked for, either via a role directly or as part of a project like we did with Dev. We'll also see sort of uh, what you can and can't do with it today, what the uh, different pre-created roles uh, are made of, and sort of the high level, what we just saw, how to go ahead and set this up yourself. There is a more robust user guide as well that goes into the specific upgrade process that we just saw, uh, <laughs> as well as do, 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 the full API reference. So everything here is accessible via an authenticated API. And we have some nice examples of some curl commands that we could do to run various get posts and puts to the API. Uh, so if you want to learn more, get your hands dirty. This is a great place to go. Uh, if you are using the older version of IAM today, it's a very similar format. Uh, the biggest difference is the lack of uh, projects and those uh, chef managed roles. So you pretty much had to go in and create your, your fine grained IAM. 
So like I say, if you migrate to A2, it will copy any V1 IAM policies that you've created so that you can go ahead, either confirm that you still want to use them and call it a day or uh, have a plan to migrate them to uh, a newer policy. And either way, you only remove the old policy once new things are looking good. So lots of uh, ways to get that upgrade rolling in a safe way. Uh, and with that, I want to uh, spend a little time talking about the applications dashboard in Chef Automate, uh, which I've been excited about for a while. Uh, uh, Natalie, what's sort of uh, new under the yeah, right, put you right <laughs> back in the spotlight. Uh, right, very <laughs> what's, excited. What's new in app world in Chef Automate? Okay, so um, the applications tab is correlated to our product for Chef Habitat. If you're not familiar with Chef Habitat, um, it provides automation capabilities for defining packaging and uh, delivering applications to almost any environment with any operating system on any platform. So what we did for Chef Automate um, in relation to the, our product Chef Habitat was we show you the information about your infrastructure configuration with Chef Infra, your compliance status with Chef Inspec, and um, now it provides insight into your application services as well. So by combining all this data in a single dashboard, um, you have visibility for your entire enterprise automation stack. Excellent. And uh, anything in development, anything cool and new that we're looking forward to getting into the apps, apps dashboard? Um, so what we'll probably end up looking at, again, because we just released this um, in early February, Again, we'll be looking for some customer feedback. We're also currently in the process of doing customer interviews to learn a little bit more about what more our customers would like to see and um, how we can better, again, improve their user experience. Excellent. Yeah, and I think with that, I'll dive back into my Automate server, um, but I've been having a lot of fun with it. So, uh, <laughs> hey, hey, Lagomorph, indeed, yay for Chef Automate. <laughs> uh, so, uh, one of the things that uh, I've enjoyed is that part of my day-to-day -day job is putting together demo materials that our sales team can use, our training team can use. I'll use it if I'm, you know, talking to analysts or customers. Uh, and when it comes to talking about Chef Habitat, one of the cool things that it enables you to do is really have a consistent way to manage a really diverse array of application types. Uh, and can I have my, my producer get my screen share going? And we'll get that up and running. Um, but at a high level, when we're packaging things up with Chef Habitat, you'll see a tease of the applications tab here, uh, we end up getting uh, a heart or a habitat artifact, which is a little bit different from some application artifacts that folks might have worked with in the past. Uh, using the example of something like a Java app. So this is near and dear to me in my past life as a sysadmin. I'd have to deploy a lot of Java apps, and that would usually mean that a developer would send me a WAR file, a compiled uh, bit of Java code, and then I would go ahead and take that and deploy it into a server I'd set up, install things like Tomcat to run a web server, and whatever else I needed to get that uh, to its final stage. What's different about Chef Habitat is that our artifacts don't just have compiled code. They have uh, instructions for all of the lifecycle events uh, are uh, going to be necessary for this application. So what does it mean to install the app? What, is, uh, what should my app be doing if it's in a healthy state? All of that gets built into an application artifact itself, along with dependencies required for build and management. And uh, it looks like uh, our, our fan, Quick Brown Dog, likes one of the stickers on your laptop there. What we got here? <laughs> oh, that is rad. Is it the, uh, got the, the Chef Pride sticker? And yeah, and then the DevOps sticker. Our sticker game is on point here. <laughs> Excellent. Now I've got to get up to speed. This is a newer laptop, and so it's not full of stickers like my old ones seem to be. I've got a little compliance sticker that the camera can't see, but that's about it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I grab uh, the dependencies that I need to build and run my application as part of this process. Uh, and what's unique here is that each of those dependencies is a Habitat uh, application itself. So I have not only the dependencies that I have explicitly said my app needs, but all of the transitive dependencies that those things individually depend on. 
This is cool because when I run this, I have full control over everything down to the build of things all the way down to like, you know, GCC libs. And I'm not depending on whatever's running on my underlying OS. I also have the ability, you see these channels up here, where the one I'm looking at here is in the stable channel, unstable channel, and some other channels. And this is how we promote artifacts with Chef Habitat. So you see in my National Parks app, I've got the unstable channel and the dev channel. I've got a little Node.js app we'll be looking at today where I've got a few more channels I've deployed to. But each of these are essentially uh, kind of an environment, not quite like a one-to-one -one representation of an environment as we'll see. Uh, for example, in this app, I've got my dev and prod. Those seem pretty straightforward. But I also have a couple other prod channels. Uh, the reason for this is this app is doing a canary deploy and uh, I want to make sure that I'm not deploying to all of prod at once, but that I'm staggering that deploy first to my canary, and then to the first 50% of machines, and then to the rest of them. So that ends up being a promotion of three channels. Uh, telling you all this, because we're actually going to get to follow a canary deploy in that Applications tab in Chef Automate to see what this actually looks like. Uh, and let's see, Wake Up Godfrey says, talking about the potential of application, Applications tab in 2016. Often, it's awesome to see it coming into fruition. Indeed, I'm real excited about it, uh, especially since uh, back in the day I had to do a lot of like custom Kibana dashboards and the like to go talk to the Habitat API. So having something built in that I can just go in and reference has been a godsend for me. And back in my dashboard, you can actually see at a high level what's going on in my environment. So I've got 27 applications total uh, that I'm managing here. Some of them with a few instances running. So, for example, that sample node app prod that we were talking about before has three instances, uh, whereas dev has one. We can also see things like what version and build are running in each of those environments. And indeed, since I can package up any application with Chef Habitat, it's not just the front end applications themselves. Audit baseline here, and there'll be config baselines as well. What are these? These are Chef Infra and Chef Inspec, or rather Chef Inspec and Chef Infra, in the order I said them, which we package up with Chef Habitat the same way I might do an application. So to give an idea of like what all that looks like, I have uh, in another one of my environments here, you can see the Terraform I use to spin up all of my little dummy servers here. And in particular, I have a couple that I very specifically didn't configure anything on yet. So we can kind of get an idea of what it looks like uh, to deploy an application. There's two machines here, so rather than connect to them individually, I'm going to use oops, a tool called Chef Run, and I'm actually going to turn off my screen share a bit as I go into my secret, secret dock here. Let's hope I didn't just screw up the stream by doing that. Yay, it just goes back to us. Uh, and grab the copy-paste that I thought I had in my uh, buffer. <laughs> All right. And now, super secret text document out of the way. I can plug myself back in. <laughs> keep it secret. Keep it safe. Indeed, indeed. Oh, the lower third was obscured by the Twitch overlay. Good note. And I actually can see that in the live stream. So, uh, the good news is I think that that lower third, yeah, is going to be mostly white space. But I'll be mindful of it as we go through. Thanks, uh, thanks for that. Uh, so, what did I just copy-paste? Sneakily, well, I'm going to go ahead and paste it. So here, I am using a tool called Chef Run. And uh, I even copy-pasted this before and had the same problem. I didn't actually fix the slash that was missing. Uh, did I at least fix the uh, smart dashes? I did. Excellent. So <laughs> what's happening in the background here? So Chef Run, if you're not familiar, is a utility that's built into Chef Workstation. Um, and it lets us do ad hoc execution agentless over uh, whatever machines we can connect to over SSH or WinRM. It takes uh, a comma delineated list of targets. So I'm actually using the Terraform output command to grab the IP addresses of my unmanaged machines. And then I am running a chef resource. So I can run cookbooks and recipes, or in this case, I'm just running a single execute resource. This is going to load my National Parks app. It's going to set it's uh, deploy strategy, so as soon as there is a new release in this app's channel, it deploys at once. You can set a group in a channel. I'd set this one up for blue-green deploys, so they have a little bit different setup than uh, the sample node app we'll be looking at later. And I set up binds, so this talks to a database, uh, MongoDB, and so I'm telling it which database to talk to. And you can see here, I did forget something. I get the 
failed to log in because I didn't set a user and it tried to log in as root. So let's go ahead and set the user to CentOS like it kindly told me to do. Uh, and we can go ahead and see what ends up happening here. It's gonna go ahead and connect to those machines. Uh, since I've never run a uh, Chef Client on these before, it goes and sees that there's no Chef Client there. It's gonna upload the client for this one-time run. And we're gonna go ahead and run through that execute resource. And if I did my job right, what we'll end up seeing back in uh, Automate here, if I filter by package and we go to my National Parks package, you'll see that right now, green has two nodes, blue has two nodes. I'm bootstrapping two more nodes into blue. So if I do my job right, once this is done, I should now see four nodes in blue and two in green. So we can have that be a accurate representation of what reality looks like at any given time. Uh, as this runs through this thing, you can see now it has installed the Chef Client, so it's just applying this execute resource that I've asked it for. Uh, and it's going to do that in parallel to these two machines. Uh, so I have found it scales pretty nicely unless you're doing things like, you know, uploading a package from your local machine, uh, at which point, you know, your, your internet connectivity mileage may vary. Uh, but I've only ever had it be an issue when I tried to do it to like 50 machines over hotel Wi-Fi, which uh, I don't recommend, uh, as it turns out. Uh, but in this case, you'll sort of see it's just going to go ahead and run those commands. It's going to report back its status. Since I'm giving it an execute resource here, it's pretty simple on the status front. It'll just give me a zero or a one on success or failure to run whatever command I asked it for. Uh, I can do the same thing with uh, cookbooks and recipes as well. So now this has completed. Let's first make sure I wasn't a liar. Do I have new things showing up for me in uh, National Parks Blue? Uh, oh no, I put them into green. That's right. I did have that in my command. Yep, I just spoke wrong. It is green in here. All right. So aside from uh, my mouth getting in my way, at least we do see the behavior expecting, just not in the group that I had originally thought. But that's okay. That's a user error and not uh, a tool error. As long as the things match, I'm a happy man. And of course, I can do this same process again. I'm just gonna go ahead and It'd probably be easier to do it the other way around. Chef run, we'll do the same thing. Just run it, write it out, perform output, MP, prod, unmanaged. Everyone loves watching me type, right? And it helps if I remember what the hell I actually called the cookbook in here. As well, effortless DCA, that's what I called it. So, remember how I said you guys love watching me type? Public, IPs, excellent. And what did I call it? I said it was called uh, Effortless DCA. Correct, <laughs> or detect rather. Everyone loves watching me type. Thanks, Lagomorph. Effortless DCA detect. So in this case, I am running a detect recipe outside of my cookbook. But as with before, I deleted everything, including my user and key. So let's get those back. And now we should see a little bit better. Uh, since uh, I didn't clean anything up from last time, it doesn't need to install Chef Client this time. We can just go around uh, and hit up this detect cookbook. What does the detect book cookbook do? Well. It installs the audit baseline have package, which will not only give us uh, some more output in that applications tab, but I should see some new uh, chef inspect audits show up at the end of this as well. Um, and again, I can do the same thing with config. I think we'll skip that for this run, but it'll essentially be the same process, except I run chef infra instead of chef inspect. And then these new inspect scans that I did that I am assuming uh, we'll come back. Are they, uh, doo -doo -doo. or perhaps I didn't set up my, uh, conf oh, wait, no, there were some failures. All right. So they're starting to report back. That's right. I need to actually, when this finishes, it just loads the habitat package and then the habitat package goes and run inspect. So got to wait for that inspect scan to happen. But now you can see my unmanaged machines are starting to show up in the list there. There we go. Three failures. That's what I'm expecting. The machine that messed up on its yum install earlier. And then the two machines I just added that I haven't done any configuration on. So, so far, it falls in line with my expectations. 
Now, I mentioned earlier that we get some extra data out of this Applications tab. And indeed, I mentioned I can define an application-specific health check. So I have a failing app here. You can see what that looks like. The app is loaded, but it's failing its health check. So the dashboard is telling me about that. Uh, I'm also running Jenkins from a Habitat package. Uh, and this one I grabbed from elsewhere, and the maintainer of this package hasn't put a health check in it yet. So what the dashboard tells me is it doesn't know about the app's health because I haven't told it how to check that, but it at the very least sees that the application is connected and reporting in. Whereas if uh, it stops communicating for whatever reason, either it loses communication to Chef Automate or someone turns off the app, we'll see it show up in disconnected here. With that, let's actually do a uh, deploy. So this is the sample node app. If you've run through uh, the tutorials on uh, habitat.sh or Learn Chef Rally, you've probably seen some version of this application. Uh, by default, it shows the semantic version that we've put into our metadata. Uh, I've updated it to also include the build, uh, so that if I kick off a new build and don't bump my versions, I can still see which version of code I'm running on here. And that's going to be important for a moment, because I'm going to do just that. Uh, I mentioned I'd set up a Jenkins server, uh, and I set up a little pipeline for this sample node app. And I'm going to go ahead and just trigger a new build so we can see uh, what it looks like to promote these packages and how we can use the app dashboard in uh, Chef Automate to track this release as we promote it. So what's happening here? So in my Jenkins pipeline, it is running a command called have package build. It's actually using a Habitat plugin uh, to do this. And the nice thing about this is that this pipeline does not care that this happens to be a Node.js app. Uh, I actually have uh, some similar pipelines I set up for National Parks, which is a Java app, uh, as well as Contoso University, which is a uh, demo ASP.NET app for Windows. And in all of those cases, my pipeline looks almost identical. Since, as we talked about, my package defines what actually building it looks like. So in the case of National Parks, I mentioned that I might have a war file that my devs hand me into my past life. How did they create that row file or that war file? They ran a command called maven package to do that. Here I have a build phase inside of Habitat that defines that process. So I just take that source code and do whatever is defined in the build phase. Sample node app is actually a little bit easier because we have scaffolding for Node.js and I have absolutely no idea what the command is to build the node app because I didn't have to. Here I've just declared that I'm using the node scaffolding and you'll see that there's no definition of build because the scaffolding defines that for me. I don't have any problems with the defaults, so as long as my app gets deployed, I'm good. If I do care about what's happening in the background, of course I can go look at the log here and see all the stuff that gets downloaded, the commands that get run, and out the other end I get a Habitat artifact. What happens next in the pipeline? It uploads that artifact to Builder, so I should actually go into Sample Node App here and be able to see in the latest package that a new build just got released, 303, 18, that looks like the timestamp uh, in UTC for right now. Uh, and indeed, you actually see it's in a dev channel. How did that happen? Well, in my Jenkins pipeline, it uploaded it to Builder, and then it promoted to the dev channel. Again, I'm using the plugin here, but it's a simple command. Have package promote the artifact, the one we just built, to dev. Then, and this is the part I enjoy, it waits for the deploy to dev. It doesn't deploy to dev because, as mentioned, I'm using that at once strategy. So development's actually just automatically triggering a deploy whenever there's a new release in the dev channel. So all my pipeline does is it hits the builder API to see, well, what's the latest release in the dev channel? It's this 80200. And indeed, we can see in here, the latest release in dev is 80200. But, of course, that deploy hasn't happened yet. It takes a minute. So in this case, we're using uh, the supervisor API. This is an API you can use to query the running state of applications. And I'm just essentially watching my dev environment. And until those numbers match, it waits. When those numbers match, it then hits a health check endpoint, also available via that same API. So again, my pipeline here is just using the Habitat internals to query about what's happening but I don't need to know or care in the pipeline itself what healthy means for my Node app. I just know that the Node app reports itself as healthy, and so my pipeline is happy. There's a human gate here before I promote to Canary, so let's make sure 
that there aren't any weird false positives, am I running that new version? Hey, hey, 8200. So in my dev environment, the new version is live. In my prod environment, which is sitting behind a load balancer, I can go ahead and keep refreshing this and it's still on that old 3949 release. So we haven't seen that release in prod yet. <laughs> Indeed, Bob Ross and his happy little pipelines. Uh, God bless that man. So, am I ready to promote to Canary? Sure I am. What does this do? The exact same thing it did for dev. So it did that had package promote, this time to the prod Canary channel, and now it's doing the same thing. It's waiting for my Canary server to take that release. It'll sit there and watch its API until those versions match. And because I have round robins set up in my uh, load balancer, when things are complete, and I'll go ahead and pull it up with its HA proxy stat so you can see, I have, uh, what is it, five machines right now behind the load balancer. When this completes, I should only have, <laughs> nice, wake up, Godfrey. Love a good uh, Bob Ross emoji. Just learned about the Kappa emoji today because I'm super hip and with it with what the kids on Twitch are doing. But, uh, I don't know, I studied enough uh, Japanese mythology to have a fondness for, for Kappa, the, the politest demon you could ever hope for. Uh, at any rate, one out of five. So when I do my Canary Deploy, one of these machines should have the new release. <laughs> Thanks, Quick Brown Dog. Uh, and the other four should have the old release. Since it's a round robin, I should be able to just hit refresh and reliably see one out of five machines on the new release. So, deploy is complete. Health is looking good. Am I on that latest version? Well, let's do a quick spot check. All right. Uh, I want to see one instance of 8200 for every four instances of 3949. Let's see if that's the case. Let's wait until we see. All right. 8200. One, two, three, four, five. If I hit reload again, I should get. Hey, look at that. So uh, some fairly compelling evidence that I've got my canary deployed to. But of course, could be cached queries, could be any number of things. So. Back to Chef Automate. This shows me reality, and right now I have a prod environment that's partially seen my deploy. Can I verify that in Chef Automate? So, Canary, 8200, prod 50, 3949, prod 3949. So I can see that one of my three prod channels is running the release, and these guys are on the older version. And of course, dev is also on the new release. So as we go through this pipeline, we'll end up seeing that now to the first 50 percent and since i have an odd number of servers i think i'm rounding down on this so we should have two on the new release three on the old release we'll find out in a second uh and that's why i like the dashboards i don't have to worry about how i did the math i can go ahead and confirm it uh but that's kind of the, the nice thing that's going on under the hood here and i when i'm building out like demo environments now it can be very powerful to really show how we abstract from whatever's running so I don't care that, for example, uh, in the case of National Pro Parks, my production environment has a clustered DB backend and my dev environment has a single node. Doesn't matter. They bind, Habitat tells it what the leader is and what its topology is. None of that has to be part of things like my pipeline. All right, so we did the first 50%. We try this once again. All right, now I see two out of every five. Again, I don't know which two they're going to be, so it's not going to be nice and pretty. But, yep, every five, I get two instances. And does Chef Automate agree with me? Oh, I could have looked here as well. Yeah, Prod50 has got one node. There you go. So these two now have the latest release, and all that's left is that final one. And as you might suspect, that's exactly what the pipeline does at this point. Uh, so as in the uh, interests of nothing up my sleeves, I'll show you what this actually looks like in my Jenkins file. But, like I say, the actual setup is pretty simple. So I'm doing this uh, via Jenkins file. As mentioned, I'm using the uh, Habitat plugin. So I have things like the Habitat task uh, item that I can add here. But each of my stages grabs my code from GitHub, grabs my secrets, and I just have those set up as Jenkins credentials, so I don't need to make them live in GitHub or anything scary like that. It builds it, it uploads it, Habtask upload, and then have task promote, and I give it a channel. What happens next? I have a couple shell scripts that hit those APIs like we talk. And then what happens next? Have task promote. Wait, have task promote. 
or wait. <laughs> so really, I'm just copy pasting those steps of the pipeline. The only thing that changes in these later stages are what channel am I promoting to, and then what uh, API endpoint am I querying, and everything else exactly the same. So I think ultimately, what you end up getting from like a pipeline design. Uh, perspective and now everything's clean I can promote to stable and we refresh everything here I can see all of the channels this package lives in now from stable to all of the other channels we promoted through down the chain uh, it allows me to create very uh, homogeneous pipelines even if I have a very heterogeneous application uh, library is even if I'm doing things on Windows and if you see uh, I've got a Contoso University uh, and the biggest difference in its Jenkins file, I'm not using Docker to build because uh, it takes a little bit longer. So when I run the build step, I just say Docker false, but it's the same uh, plugin. The only other difference, of course, is that uh, since I'm running it locally, I want to make sure that I copy uh, the resulting uh, artifact out of the ephemeral studio directory that Jenkins uses. But that's Jenkins internals, nothing too fancy there. As far, oh, excuse me, as far as everything else, upload, promote, just like before. So I get to be uh, a little less uh, uh, caring of what I need in my pipeline. I don't need to go ahead and install a bunch of uh, language specific things here, just Habitat. And Habitat, when it runs this build all the way back in step two here, is going to grab everything else it needs. My app, well, need GCC, need Linux headers, it needs JQ static and all that stuff, and just whatever I've got in my scaffolding package, and it installs all that. And right down to the release of every single dependency used, I can go ahead and interrogate uh, my pipeline for that data. And a little bit of a tease, uh, one of the other things I was playing around with in here uh, is what other data you can get from that API. And so I noted earlier that I have that broken National Parks app. What's up with that? Well, I'm going to go ahead and grab uh, my National Parks repo so we can see what it looks like to actually build things and why that one might be failing. Uh, and you get a little bit of a tease of the kind of power that lies under the hood uh, inside of uh, Chef Habitat. And again, Automate's already telling me the health status and the version here, uh, but since I have a broken thing, I need to do a little bit more investigation. So this pipeline is going to create a fresh build, and that takes about a minute and a half. Uh, but yeah, my National Parks app got furloughed a bit. Uh, we'll see what's actually breaking things here and whether or not, even in the pipeline here, I can get any insight into the nature of the break. Bit of a spoiler alert, there's a lot of ways an app can break. Uh, of course, I could have pushed a code update that was invalid. Uh, but this one's a little bit more insidious. It's my favorite kind of failure. What happens when I didn't change anything in the app itself? but something upstream changed. Let's say I had a new CVE came out and I needed to patch library X across all of my systems. But one of my apps started breaking when I tried updating library X. Well, in the case of a very you know specific triggered event like a CVE, it might be easy to determine that. But stuff gets updated all the time in environments. And being able to track that stuff down eats up a lot of time uh, from my system administrator Campatriots, heck, even devs, right? You need to figure out why the break happened, and it could be the code if you don't know already. So everybody puts their heads together. What if the pipeline could tell me right off the bat? So what am I going to do here? Well, we mentioned that I can go ahead and in, say, Builder, see all of the transitive dependencies that were used uh, in this application. I can also get that data from the API that we used to find the running version of the app when I was doing my deployment check. So in the case of a failure, I now have two artifacts that I can compare. What does it look like in stable, in builder, in presumably the last known good version of my project versus one that's failing build? So let's see, a minute 42 means this is probably close to done. Yep, Maven's happening. That usually means I'm nearing the end. All right, it's creating my package. Excellent, I filibustered long enough. Again, this pipeline works exactly the same way as the other pipeline. So while it does do fancier stuff in prod, blue, green deploys, all that fun stuff, as far as the dev deploy, again, all I'm doing is an at one strategy. I'm waiting for dev to see the update. Uh, I think right now I have it set up to poll every minute. So at most this takes 60 seconds to trigger and the update itself goes pretty quick. Could take longer if you know your update uh, scripts do a bunch of stuff. But in this case, all I'm doing is, is copying a new war file in and seeing how everything looks. So 
Should be pretty quick. And let's see, no new questions in chat. Excellent. Feel free to hit us up. Since we were talking Kappa, fun fact about Kappa, you know, uh, you know, Rumpelstiltskin, you got to say his name backwards. The way that you get a Kappa is you bow to it. Kappas have a little indent in their forehead with water in, and they need that water to live. Being a polite demon, if you bow to the Kappa, the Kappa will bow back to you, and the water will fall out of their head. Problem solved. <laughs> they will try to pull your kidney out your butt if you don't do that, though, I think is their thing. Yeah. <laughs> Mythical demons are weird, Natalie, I, turns I out. I thought you said it was a nice demon. Well, it's a polite demon. Uh, if, you know, season three of Buffy taught me anything, you can be polite and be evil. Uh, all right. Uh, can we get the screen share back up? We got to the fun part. So, it does its deploy to dev, and this time when it got to check dev health, it failed. So it does something a little extra. As mentioned, it's going to go ahead and reach out first to the stable branch uh, or the stable channel on uh, Habitat Builder and compare whatever is in there against my running package. And I can see right down at the bottom here, there is a mismatch. So the dependency uh, lib hello world is running a different version in stable than what I'm running in dev here. So that might be a good indicator of what I need to do to fix things. One of the cool things you can do here actually is I should be able uh, to just go into my lib hello world, and here's that stable version that broke things, and just demote it. Maybe this release isn't ready for prime time. At that point, all I need to do, kick off a new build, and things should just build successfully. Alternatively, I can go ahead and say, you know what, maybe that was a CVE. I want to keep that uh, on the latest release, and my other apps can consume it. Well, I can go ahead and copy-paste this right out of uh, my error here and add it to my plan. So when in National Parks, I define my dependencies, right now I'm just defining NRICAR lib hello world. And that's just going to pull latest stable. I can be more specific and say, I want you to grab NRICAR lib hello world and this specific, you know, release, the 4.0.0, et cetera, et cetera. Another reason I'm fond of this is because it hits an edge case that came up all the damn time when I was a sysadmin, which is what happens when... The semantic version actually is the same, and I very intentionally didn't bump the version here to show that even at the build level, I can detect those changes. Uh, that was often a problem when you had a lot of like off-the-shelf, like you know, uh, vulnerability scanners. That uh, we ran a scientific Linux shop, fun inside baseball. One of the things they like to do in their uh, yum repositories is add security patches, but keep it on the old release version. So the scanners would go ahead and say, hey, you're running an outdated version of software that needs to be patched. But in actuality, you could actually go and look at the build and see this actually was patched. All you're looking at is a semantic version and stopping. Uh, so this goes a little bit more ingrained and comes right out of that API. Indeed, the mayor is polite but evil. I knew, I knew, I knew I'd get someone in the chat with that ref. <laughs> uh, and I think with that, that's the, the meat of what I wanted to show off today. Uh, to come back into the Chef Automate dashboard here again, uh, we always get a view of reality from here. So whether it's my compliance state and how many of my machines are passing and failing, my configuration management, whether Chef Infra has applied my configs properly, and now my application status. What is uh, Chef Habitat running all the way down to? You can see Chef Habitat running Chef Inspect. So this is telling me the health of the Chef Inspect package itself, and this is telling me the output of what Chef Inspect was doing. In either case, though, again, uh, when we look at things like audit and config in here, uh, we have more than just the Inspect and Infra executables. But here I've actually, in like the packages I built, get to define things like uh, you know cookbooks and and run settings, and in this case, you know toggleable uh, configurations to send data to Chef Automate. And, and all of that lives in the artifact itself so that I don't have to worry about, you know, different versions. Everything in here is uh, locked into whatever it was when I built it. If I want to change it, I can promote a new version of my config and audit policies the same way I might promote new changes to code. So even when we're talking about middleware and tools management, we can pipeline that. It can break our apps, so why not make it a part of this process? Uh, and I think that's, you know, the crux of it. And what questions can I answer from folks in chat? I think we got 
about 10 minutes before we're scheduled to go off air, but I'm always happy to chat. And indeed, oh, it looks like uh, demoting that library cleared up my health check in national parks. So now I can go ahead and go through the rest of the pipeline build, things are healthy, and in my applications tab, no longer have anything failing. So again, once we hit, fix that issue, I can come right back in here, confirm that the fix took, uh, and that my pipeline, Chef Automate, and my running servers agree. And of course, the proof is in the pudding, right? Can I go to National Parks in Dev? And, well, helps if I give it the right uh, URI. And, ooh, hey, it's my uh, <laughs> National Parks application. Always good to see another view of reality on the Internet. Indeed. It's uh, when things don't match that uh, I always have the most fun happen. But I've always said, like, I learned everything I needed to learn about administering systems from Sesame Street. <laughs> One of these things is not like the other. If it's working somewhere, what's different in my environment? And do I have the tools to figure out what's different? Everything else is just, well, how do I tell what's running? That's the, the stuff that changes. But the actual work, it's going to be the same regardless of what technology we're using tomorrow. Can I find something working? Can I compare it against something that's not? And how easy is that process? Mm, our job is to make that as easy as possible. Man, I gotta save really rad conclusions like that for at the hour. Now I'm just gonna <laughs> stare blankly into the camera. Like, that was that was that was my head. Good click. Yeah, cut print. Uh huh. Hey, and I just make faces at the camera. <laughs> so I do want to say. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyone out there, any one of our customers that are using IAM or um, Habitat uh, or for our applications tab, if you have any suggestions, you know, please feel free to go to our Chef Idea portal and put them there. Mm. Or if you're interested in getting interviewed or participating in um, any of our uh, user studies, please feel free to reach out to your account manager and have them reach out to me. And is that the... Right. All right, yeah. can I share the screen once more? Uh, the Chef Idea Portal, if you've never been, uh, is at chef-software.ideas.aha.io. Uh, so this is where you can actually see and vote on any ideas that have come from sort of community members at large, uh, as well as adding your own ideas for, you know, whatever uh, you think you've got uh, an idea for. So we love to see your feedback here, and if you see someone else that's like, ah, that's my idea, Throw your vote on there. It's a good way that we can gauge how uh, uh, important a particular request is to uh, users of Chef. Ah, yes. Thanks for throwing that in the chat. Well, and if no one clipped it, Lagomorph, the video is available on demand after the fact. So there are many opportunities for whatever embarrassing animated GIFs people want to create of me. <laughs> yeah, I just swallowed my pride and said, Jeff, the peanut butter company has, has bought in on it, so I'm, I'm fighting a losing yeah. battle. <laughs> yeah, it's my, my, my own personal brand of pedantry. <laughs> oh, right on. I think it's officially called Yiff. I what? think that that might cause some unfortunate overlaps with, well... <laughs> Depending on what what your position is, fortune overlaps. I don't know what people. I don't. You know what? I've already talked about Kappa. I don't think I need to get into yiffing on this channel. That's that's some next level Twitch streaming. <laughs> uh, needless to say, I I have yet to crystallize on a canonical uh, pronunciation of GIF GIF people. So <laughs> <laughs> what happens when they point a camera at me and tell me you to riff things. Like, you don't want us to call it drop it. I guess. <laughs> Oh, reg, I say regex, regex is fine, I don't have, I don't have, it's not like an, a NES versus NES holy war that I need to have, like, regex, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly open. I go with NES and SNES, but if you're a NES and a SNES person, I don't, I don't judge you, I just, well, I don't judge <laughs> you, you judge out loud. Them. Yeah, I like you judge them. Yeah. I have, I have strong feelings about acronyms, but I think that's what being in marketing is all about, right? <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Um, the other one that, that gets me in the chef world is that CCR stopped meeting Credence Clearwater Revival and started meeting Chef Client Run. Uh, but I guess it'll be CICR now, so Chef Infra Client Run. Sicker. No, don't like it. Redacted. 
And I think that's about, oh, before I forget, a plug, uh, we will be doing a webinar on uh, the IAM policy later this month. Uh, if you are curious, uh, chef.io slash webinar will have all the deets for that one. Let's see, what is, uh, we don't have the date up. It'll be at the end of the month. So we've got one coming up on the 19th, uh, which is on edge computing automation with Chef. That should be fun. And then I think it's a couple weeks after that, that we'll be doing the IAM webinar. That'll be me again. Uh, but Keep uh, tuned to chef.io slash chef webinars, follow the link in chat. You'll also see all of our older webinars on demand available there as well. Now let's think, do we have any other fun bookkeeping uh, going on? Should I plug ChefConf? Yeah, ChefConf is uh, coming up in June. Uh, the call for presentations is closed, but that doesn't mean uh, there's not fun to be had. So yes, June 1st through 4th uh, in Seattle and June 15th to 17th in London, uh, we will be doing ChefCom. Uh, I know that uh, we have gotten questions uh, about uh, coronavirus in Seattle and as of right now, there's no plans to change anything, but of course we'll make everybody uh, aware if uh, situations change in Seattle, but far enough away, knock on wood, that hopefully we won't have to worry about that come time. Or cancel it. Yeah, we have a lot of good stuff coming up for ShopCon for sure on the product side. Mm -hmm. Definitely stay tuned. Let's see, are there any other events? Uh, I think, you know, we do, like, continuing to do plugs. We do uh, have uh, our uh, meetups that happen in our office here in Pioneer Square. We've been hosting the Seattle DevOps meetup the past few months. Uh, we love hosting that here as well as uh, Coffee Ops every other Friday. Uh, if you want to get some some lean coffee action, all at uh, 619 Western in uh, Pioneer Square, Seattle. The construction is mostly done now, so your, your Lyft and Uber drivers should have an easier time finding us. <laughs> and for folks not in Seattle, we just had a big viaduct get demolished that made downtown uh, traffic haywire. Uh, so, fingers crossed, but it looks like we're out of the worst of it. And with that, I think I'm officially spent. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing it's been get to detect. Give us time. <laughs> right on. All right. I think we're good then. Excellent. Just say bye. Bye, bye. everybody. <laughs>